Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Kendall Bauer, and today's presentation is Predation, Ecological and Evolutionary Necessity, presented by wildlife biologist and wolf expert, Aaron Bott. Aaron, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. I'm gonna hand it off to you. Thanks, thanks Kendall, and thanks everyone for tuning in. I'm excited to be sharing this topic with you all. Hopefully we'll walk away with a little bit of a better understanding of what predation is. I chose to begin my presentation today by sharing this image taken from the air of a bison in Hayden Valley surrounded by wolves. Hayden Valley is in Yellowstone National Park and in Yellowstone there is a full complex suite of carnivores like wolves and grizzly bears, black bears, mountain lions, even wolverines and coyotes. Um, and all of these carnivores are supported by a, a full complex suite of herbivores like this bison here. And oftentimes when we think about predation, we picture carnivores like wolves and this kind of delicate and lethal dance between these carnivores who are trying to bring down often herbivores that are a lot bigger than they are. And it's a really a remarkable uh, feat to witness, whether you're out in the field on a natural habitat adventures trip, watching this happen through a scope, or whether you're watching it from the comfortable armchair in your living room on a, a nature documentary. But predation really has a lot more complexity than kind of this uh, idealized dance between carnivores and herbivores. And today we're going to get into the weeds a little bit on what predation actually entails. And we're going to talk about why it is important and how it has evolved and influenced all life on Earth. And uh, hopefully we'll have some good Q&A at the end. So as Kendall so generously introduced me. I am a wildlife biologist. Um, I work for government agencies as a wolf biologist. I did my graduate research in Yellowstone on wolves. I'm still working on a doctorate right now on wolves, um, but I've had the opportunity to work on a whole bunch of other animals here in the American West where I've lived my whole life. Um, as a wolf biologist, it's inevitable that I'm fascinated with predation because that's one of the first questions that any biologist asks when they're studying carnivores in particular, is what kind of impact does my carnivore have on its prey? And what are the consumption rates or the kill rates of this predator? How effective are they at hunting? And so on and so on. So I guess it's kind of a a given that I would be interested in predation. But again, uh, starting out first just as an interested individual growing up on a landscape that had all these large carnivores, uh, then transitioning into more of a field of research and uh, conservation management, I began to appreciate just how complex predation actually is. So this is what we think about, as I already man mentioned uh, with my introductory slide, but generally we envision predation being something raw and dramatic and very often violent. Um, but more often than not, it's a little bit less noticeable. Everything in nature boils down to the importance of foraging or simply consumption of calories in order for our bodies to function. Um, all organisms really depend on their ability to eat and to obtain enough nutrients and calories in order for them to live out their life history. And indisputably, this is the most important aspect of all animal behavior. Uh, if you can't eat, then you can't do anything else. Uh, you're not able to first survive, you're not able to develop and to grow, and you're not able to reproduce. So all of those key elements in, um, in life that are so important to us, if we're not able to effectively forage, if we're not able to effectively eat, then everything else is kind of pointless. 
Uh, a couple months ago, I gave a webinar presentation with Natural Habitat Adventures called Eat to Live um, and talked about the importance of foraging and how animals have evolved evolutionarily in order to um, exploit the natural, rule, the natural world to a, a variety of degrees in order to try and uh, get a niche where they're able to consume what they need to in order to fulfill the rest of their um, life's requirements. So predation is simply a, one style of foraging, and it's a pretty common method of foraging. So let's define what predation is. Um, predation is simply the consumption of an organism by an other organism where the prey is alive when the predator first attacks. So it doesn't have to be a consumption by a carnivore. Carnivore is an animal that consumes meat, but herbivores also are considered predators because they are preying upon another organism that is alive. There's different varying degrees of what predation actually is. And the four main types of predators include what we, again, first would imagine to be a predator or perhaps even a, a carnivore. True predators, such as that lion chasing the zebra, are uh, very obvious to us. Again, typically they come from the order carnivora, so these large um, meat eaters as they pursue other animals on the landscape. That is an obvious, obvious form of predation. Uh, but grazers, or animals that eat plants, they are also predators. Um, in most cases, grazers are not killing the organism that they are consuming, although they do injure it, uh, they're nevertheless predators, and they're constantly on the lookout for other uh, organic material that they can consume and ingest for their own benefit. Then we have parasites like nematodes and worms, those nasty things that give us the shivers that um, have a predatory relationship with a host that they live off of, and they can uh, sometimes indirectly or directly affect the host in negative ways. And in some cases, there's just commensalism where the parasite is simply living off of the host and the host might not even be aware of it. So that's a type of predation. And then there's parasitoids, which are generally groups of insects that typically belong to the order Hypermenotropa, um, but there's a couple other varieties out there as well. And these are also um, kind of the kind of the organisms in the animal kingdom of nightmare where they uh, will not only become parasites for other organisms, but they also will uh, plant their eggs on other spiders or other um, like wood lice in order to exploit them as a resource for their own reproductive opportunities. Um, so these are the, the four main categories of predators. And again, I think it's important for us to realize that while we often think of the lion chasing the zebra as an obvious form of predation, uh, there are predation, our predation is taking place in various forms throughout the animal kingdom at all, all levels, all different degrees on a trophic level. So this is important for us to Remember, especially today, uh, as I go through my presentation, I am biased because I'm a wolf biologist and I, I often focus on large carnivore predation of herbivores, but remember that predation can take place in a variety of areas and in a variety of ways. Now, very often we oversimplify what predation actually is. We sometimes think, and this is the number one question I get asked as a wolf biologist, is how do wolves affect elk populations? Um, how many wolves does it take to bring down an elk? Or how many elk are consumed by a wolf a year? Questions like this are binary and they're very oversimplistic. And too often we think about uh, this cat and mouse game where they're almost in a vacuum and there's nothing else at play to take into consideration. But it's very important for us to remember that all organisms are part of an ecosystem. 
and what might be apparent or even cause an effect in one environment might not be applicable to another environment. So when it comes to predation, it's important again for us to remember that our subjects that we're interested in studying, they don't live in a vacuum. It's never just the cat and the mouse. There's a whole bunch of other environmental or ecological factors at play. Um, things can boil down to simply the body condition or the life history or the genetics or the makeup of each individual predator, um, as well as the environment that they're living in and the climate and uh, the abundance of prey and how many other predators are on the landscape? And are they of the same species or are they different species? How many prey items are on the, on the same landscape and what types of variety do they hold? Um, so clear cut uh, questions and answers regarding predation uh, aren't really available to us. And so it's important as biologists and researchers for us to study different ecosystems and different environments to try and tease out answers and then try and uh, compare and contrast them with other populations elsewhere. Uh, another really great example that comes to my mind is in Yellowstone we have wolves sharing the landscape with what we call a, a complete carnivore guild. So again all the large carnivores that should be on the landscape that were historically on the landscape are there today. So the wolf shares um, space with the grizzly bear, with the mountain lion, with the coyote, and all of these carnivores, um, they have to navigate the landscape together, which is very different when you contrast it with an area uh, where wolves perhaps are recovering, but grizzly bears no longer exist on the landscape, or perhaps in an environment where you have mountain lions, but you don't have wolves and grizzly bears. And also, you have to take into consideration the abundance of prey to how many uh, prey animals are out there or prey items are out there on the landscape that can be exploited by these different predators. So my point being, it's complicated and it's important for us to, to take various examples across the global landscape to try and better understand and appreciate how a species might interact with its environment. But as I already mentioned, biologists and the public generally are interested in this one question when we look at predation. Although uh, perhaps the language might vary a little bit depending on who's asking it. But uh, essentially we want to know what effects does predation have on the distribution and the abundance of the predator and its landscape? So, or excuse me, the predator and its prey. I miss you right now. My boy just came in, so I'm sorry for the interruption. Um, but yeah, we want to know kind of how predators and their prey, whether they're animals or vegetation, how do they juggle in this dance of life? Um, kind of a very obvious example that many of us think of is the predation that comes between the lynx and the snowshoe hare and this cyclical life cycle that we often witness where there's an abundance of snowshoe hares and how they're distributed across the landscape and then we have a uh, kind of a boom bust cycle as the lynx follow in a lag time and prey upon the snowshoe hares and then the snowshoe hares decrease in abundance and therefore the the lynx decrease in abundance as well so we want to know exactly what's going on and we have to take into consideration that we're looking at an ecological scale not just a, an individual scale of of the species or the individual that we're studying at the time so the effectiveness of consumers directly affects the rate of animal populations and this is this is oversimplified and very basic um, we have for example here triceratops and a triceratops is a predator of plant material or vegetation and if you have an abundance of vegetable matter for the triceratops to consume then the overall uh, body condition of your triceratops population is going to increase 
their survival rate is gonna increase and their reproductive rate is gonna increase, which means you're ultimately gonna have more triceratops on the landscape. Um, you can then include uh, another trophic level with a carnivore like a Tyrannosaurus rex, and you can apply kind of the same equation where if you have uh, an abust, excuse me, a robust um, population of Triceratops or prey for the tri for the T. Rex, uh, the T. Rex population will again have higher survival rates, uh, higher recruitment rates. Um, this is a very simplistic way to look at what predation does for individual populations. And it makes sense. And the equation is, is kind of foolproof with the exception that it's a little bit too simplistic. And the natural world rarely is, is quite this static for long. One of the ways that biologists and researchers look at the world um, through the lens of predation is through what we call optimal foraging theory. And this is a very basic theory that is so basic that it's really kind of a slap in the face. Um, nevertheless, it's, it's a question that has to be asked. Um, why do animals eat what they eat? Why do they eat what they eat is, in a nutshell, the optimal foraging theory. Um, with a lot of different resources on the landscape, why is it that the lion chooses to go after the wildebeest? Or why is it that the crocodile chooses to eat uh, the zebra in this case? Um, why does the panda bear only consume the bamboo? Why do animals eat what they eat when, uh, evolutionarily speaking, they could have gone any uh, which way um, in terms of their overall development and their selection of, of resources? So. The answer to this question is uh, animals eat what they eat because it has been favored by natural selection in the past. Um, this is where evolution comes into play, right? So animals as they evolve and as they change, organisms as they change over um, deep time, over thousands of years, millions of years, um, all depending on the organism, uh, animals tend to gravitate towards what is going to increase their fitness. And animals today, at this present state, consume what they consume because it has proved to be uh, the best course of action through natural selection. So we have, um, going way back, we've got the um, progenitor to the crocodile. Um, exploiting a tactic known as ambush or waiting for their prey to come to them in the water because that was a resource or that was a niche that had not yet been exploited or at least to a lesser degree. So crocodiles eat the same thing that lions eat. They eat wildebeests and they eat zebras. But rather than competing with the lion out on the dry land and trying to chase down and tackle their prey, they choose to wait in ambush at the river's edge where they can exploit um, prey that are um, consequently trying to avoid being chased and pursued by the lion. So these two predators are able to coexist because they have developed different kinds of foraging habits. And this again is kind of what all boils down from optimal foraging here, uh, theory, uh, this equation of trying to figure out why animals consume what they consume. Um, again, through evolutionary time, we have not just uh, predation taking place, but we also have prey avoidance of being consumed taking place. So why do some animals choose to eat some foods and not others? Well, simply put, prey want to avoid being eaten most of the time. Um, and this includes uh, plant or vegetable matter, which I think is very interesting because plants have a non-cognitive response to predation. Um, in some cases, they don't want to be consumed. And over evolutionary time, they develop hard shells or bark or thorns or nettles or spines that help protect them from uh, consumption. Um, Nevertheless, in this arms race of predator versus prey, you can have 
animals uh, develop a more robust uh, dental system or digestive system to help them uh, compete with what they're trying ultimately to extract, which is nutrients and calories. So again, I think that it's, it's really interesting to look at why animals consume different things. And in some cases, uh, evolutionary roads uh, really get kind of bottlenecked in a box canyon. And you have, let's see if it's coming up. Oh, in just a minute, we have, um, we have the development of generalists and specialists. Uh, and some animals specialize only in one food group, and that's because through evolutionary time, they've kind of uh, stuck to one path in pursuing the resource that they found to be most uh, beneficial to them through natural selection, whereas others tend to be more generalists, and they have uh, maintained an adaptive diet in response to their environment. So all of this is based off of what we call an evolutionary arms race, which I think, again, is, is pretty familiar in concept, even if you didn't know the, what it was called, um, because we all imagine predation taking place like this, where you have a group of wolves chasing an elk, and the elk has to evolve to a certain degree um, the capabilities of avoiding being eaten. If elk didn't evolve, if they didn't become fleet of foot, then they would have gone extinct a long time ago because predators like wolves would have uh, exploited them to the point of extirpation. And conversely, you have to have wolves being right behind those prey items like the elk. And if the wolves aren't evolving and becoming quicker of foot and capable of chasing and bringing down big prey items like the elk, then the wolves would have gone extinct because they wouldn't have had anything to subsist off of. Um, so this is what we call the evolutionary arms race, where prey are one step ahead of the predators, but only to a very uh, small degree. And predator lag times are just right behind them, and one is never truly better than the other. And the reason why life is so tenacious is because of this constant arms race, where there's a juggle back and forth. Some days the elk wins, some days the wolf wins. So that's the evolutionary arms race in a nutshell, but it is a little bit more complicated than that because um, organisms are also confined to evolve to what they're genetically predisposed or physiologically predisposed to evolve towards. Um, an elk population would definitely be able to avoid wolf predation if they could sprout wings, but elk don't have the genetic makeup or the physiological makeup to produce wings over time. So the best they can do is continue to develop muscles or secondary sexual characteristics that, like antlers that can also be used as weapons to, uh, to deter wolves. Um, wolves are in the dog family, obviously. They are separate from felids like the mountain lion, the cats. And so they cannot suddenly and, sp and spontaneously evolve to have um, shorter snouts and retractable claws and supinating wrists that would allow them to be as efficient at killing elk as, say, a mountain lion. So they are also confined to evolve based off of their, their physi uh, physiological constraints. So it's an evolutionary arms race, but not everything is possible. You're, you're uh, bound to evolve and to change and adapt um, based off of your own genetic and phenotypic makeup. Now, when predation comes into play, we have to take into consideration, again, going back to our original question, you know, how many elk can a wolf kill in a year? Um, what does the elk population look like after wolves have been restored? You have to take into consideration that there are not just consumption rates that we have to measure. Um, when it comes to hunting, when it comes to looking for food, there is a lot of energy that is spent, a lot of energy that is expended in the hunt. 
And again, the hunt doesn't have to just be uh, in the carnivore world. So you can have deer and elk and other herbivores that have to hunt for foraging opportunities. And this searching and then the handling time is reflected in what we call these predation functional responses. And I'm going to avoid getting into the mathy jargon here because it would just bore everyone, including myself. Um, but basically, we have different types of functional responses when it comes to predation. And some animals have very basic um, predation consumption rates such as this baleen whale here and its kind of foraging activity is reflected in the upper left hand corner of my graphs so i've got that type one consumption rate where all the baleen whale has to do is simply open up its mouth in order to consume resources there is searching time so it's not quite as simplistic as a as an exponential um, rate of consumption rate. Um, nevertheless, there's no handling time for these whales. They simply open up their mouths and they swallow their prey whole. Now that is very much in contrast with say this snake here, this type of constrictor. Uh, snakes move slowly. They have to look and search for food such as this bird and then they have to tackle the bird and then they have to not only kill it but they also have to spend time handling it in this case it's the consumption and slow slow digestion of the prey and when you have something like this you might have um, a graph that is more accurately re reflected in the the type 2 or even the type 3 consumption uh, response graphs that i have there so again when we when we consider predation it's important for us to realize that all animals have different consumption rates. They have different predatory consumption rates based off of their natural histories and how they have evolved. In some cases, it's, it's very simple, like a baleen whale, where there's no handling time. In other cases, it's extremely complex, like this snake, um, where they spend days um, and then even weeks uh, consuming and digesting uh, a prey source. This is the slide I was meaning to talk about earlier. I should have rearranged it. Um, but because of this evolutionary arms race and because of the different methods of ingestion and consumption, we have specialist animals and generalist animals. Um, this is basically a a reflection of their dietary needs. So as I mentioned earlier with the panda bear, some species through their um, their predatory predisposition, you could say, they kind of get themselves into a, a, a method of predation, which is highly uh, monophagous is what we call it. So it's a specialist type of foraging activity where the predator, feeds on a single prey type. In the case of a panda bear, the predator, being the panda bear, consumes just bamboo, so a single prey type, that bamboo being the prey. Um, and then this goes through kind of a continuum all the way up to a polyphagous feeding um, style where you have things like omnivores, um, pigs, bears, humans, uh, even to some degree canids like wolves, uh, we have a wide variety of foods that are available to us and not all of the foods that we consume are necessarily most advantageous for us to consume nutritionally. Um, but because our diet is so wide and so readily available to us, this kind of limits the amount of searching time that we have to, that we have to put forward. Um, again, going back to a monophagous or a specialist species, you've got a, a sanguinivore like a vampire bat that only consumes blood. And the bat has to wake up and fly and search for prey. And then it has to uh, have handling time. Once it finds prey, it has to latch on, it has to bite, it has to drink, it has to digest, and then make it back home. Whereas uh, something that is more of a generalist has the opportunity to 
uh, maybe not fly as far if it's a different kind of bat. They can exploit resources closer to home that might not be as nutritionally sound, but are still nevertheless available to them uh, because there's simply more available to them. They have more digestive opportunities. So the physiology of predation ultimately boils down to uh, finding your place at the dinner table is what I like to call it. And as animals evolve, they have developed different uh, physiological characteristics that help them again to exploit their resource. Carnivores have specialized teeth known as carnassials, which allow them to shear through soft flesh um, but then you have uh, omnivores like ourselves that have molars and we have to masticate our food. And then you have other animals like this pronghorn here or the hare in my image. They have specialized teeth that are built for a lot of wear and tear because they're constantly trying to extract nutrients from their prey, vegetation or plant matter, which is extremely hard to digest as well as to masticate. And I really am interested in looking at dentition. I think it's fantastic to look at how evolution has made itself manifest in so many varieties throughout the animal kingdom. Uh, if you wanna know a bit about the animal's uh, natural history and evolutionary history, all you gotta do is look at their teeth to see what it is that they do. And I think it's, it's fascinating to think about how they have found a specialized niche to exploit resources that they have available to them. So you have a reptile with fangs that has uh, venom that is extracted in a syringe-like way or is, um, is uh, produced in a syringe-like way through these fangs to immobilize your prey. If you are slow and you're cold-blooded and you take a long time to digest things, you don't have the energy to, to chase your food down. And so you need to immobilize your food in order to exploit your resource, your prey. Um, in the upper right hand corner, we have crab eater seals, which not only consume meat, but also can filter creel through those elaborate teeth. Um, of course, you got baleen whales. Um, they're incredible dentition. Um, their ability to extract resources from, from the ocean. Uh, a blue whale, the largest animal in the world, can consume up to 500,000 calories in one gulp which is truly remarkable that you can sustain an animal that large on such a small organism. Sharks have teeth that are shed constantly and replaced constantly. And then you have cervids like this moose. Um, they have uh, almost precocial, or not precocial, almost, um, I just forgot the word. They have uh, a lot of dexterity in their in their upper lips and they don't have incisors on their upper jaw, um, on, their, on the top side of their mouth. They only have incisors on their bottom jaw, which allows them to strip leaves and bark. So again, dentition showing how predation and how foraging has, has impacted each individual species. Um, in some cases we have not only a lot of variability, but if you have a generalist species or even a, um, a species that has some flexibility in its diet, we have what's known as prey switching, where simply put, one species of prey becomes more abundant than another, and so a predator might begin to simply go after what is most readily available to it. Again, when you take into, the, into consideration the equation of how much time do I need to spend searching for and then handling my food in order to make a living, uh, it's a kind of a no-brainer to imagine um, mountain lions in the Sierra Nevadas that might uh, normally or historically pursue uh, bighorn sheep if deer populations nearby become more abundant than mountain lion populations will start to gravitate towards the more abundant prey item. And uh, this is a case of prey switching. Um, in some cases, again, where you have uh, vegetable matter on the landscape, if you have a, a certain type of grass or forab that, that becomes more abundant, then prey or then predators might choose to, to spend more time consuming that other material, that other vegetable matter. Um, 
in order to extract resources rather than wasting energy searching for uh, a traditional food source. And this also can come into play when you have coexisting predators on the landscape. So with mountain lions and wolves, um, there tends to be a, a switch or a deviation in hunting tactics wherever they coexist. And this graph here that I've included is from Yellowstone showing the age classification of female elk killed by uh, mountain lions and wolves over a number of years. And mountain lions and wolves both eat elk, but mountain lions in this study particularly showed that they tended to target younger elk more than wolves did, and wolves tended to target older elk. And again, this kind of um, partitioning of predation allows these two carnivores to coexist in the same landscape. And you might not see the same thing if you didn't have wolves and mountain lions coexisting. In places where mountain lions are the only large carnivore, they might also target uh, older elk just as much as wolves do, or perhaps solely target older elk. So this cultural learning kind of comes into play, again, depending on the environment. Predators are also at risk when they're out trying to consume resources. It's a dangerous world out there. Um, even if you're a bunny rabbit or a beaver and you're trying to consume uh, vegetable material, um, as you probably know, beavers and rodents have specialized teeth. Their incisors keep growing and they have a, a coating of iron that help protect their teeth. But if their teeth break, then they're out of luck. And chewing through wood all day and chewing up the, the cambium of those woody materials can be very difficult. And everything boils down to keeping your teeth safe. Um, wolves have it really hard when they coexist with only a single prey species on the landscape, such as on Ellesmere Island, you have your Arctic wolves pursuing musk oxen. Um, but if you have a complex suite of prey items, like in Yellowstone National Park, you see that wolves tend to go after elk the most, even though bison are very abundant on the landscape. Um, bison are twice the size, if not more, twice the size of, of an elk. And so wolves generally are going to go for the better package deal, the item on the menu that is least likely to kill them. And of course, when it comes to predation, you also have what's called intraspecific and interspecific competition. I'm going to talk more about these next week on my net have a webinar. Um, but there's competition on your own trophic level. Uh, so predators, carnivores in this case, can compete with other carnivores. Um, and there is a risk of being killed by um, your by your same trophic level. Um, just because you are a predator doesn't mean that there is no competition. Even if you're a rabbit, you might not be killing each other necessarily, um, trying to get at the grass or the forbs that you want to consume. But the more abundance of rabbits there are, the higher the competition. And you are, in that case, directly competing with one another for survival. You're both trying to eat as much um, resources as possible with the understanding that resources are limited. Now I'm going to close with just a few more slides talking about the indirect effects of predation. So, so far we've been talking about the direct effects of predation, um, which are fairly obvious. Um, again, if you're taking into consideration a, a carnivore like a wolf pursuing um, an elk, the direct effects again are obvious. That wolf is either going to kill that elk and that elk's life comes to a complete stop or that wolf will not kill that elk, in which case it will have to go hungry until it gets the opportunity to pursue and then kill another elk. Um, so those are direct effects and the consequences are, are pretty obvious, life and death. But then we have the indirect effects of predation. Um, and I think this image, which is taken in Denali National Park, of a grizzly bear up in the willows there, up in the brush, looking down on a moose and her two calves, is a, a pretty, 
pretty powerful image of what the indirect effects of predation can lead to. This is often kind of partitioned in its own department of ecology known as the ecology of fear. And several months ago, I gave a webinar on the ecology of fear, kind of defining what that is exactly. Uh, the ecology of fear is a title that I think is provocative, but if I were to, if someone would have asked me what to name uh, this, this uh, discipline of ecology, I would have called it uh, the ecology of risk management. Um, because essentially the ecology of fear is simply that, it's cautious, cautious behavior influencing different things like predator-prey interactions, population dynamics, coexistence, and evolution. So we have um, different topics within the ecology of fear that I'll, I'll briefly go over, um, again, with the understanding that if you're interested in this, you can go back and watch that other webinar. Um, but life is dangerous, and not always are we comfortable being on the landscape and being fully confident that we're not going to get bumped off by something else that's out there. And this kind of fear or this kind of risky behavior going out and foraging when we think we might be uh, exposed to predation ourselves, it, it drives animal behavior and in some cases even plant behavior. So when we look at the ecology of fear and we consider things like the landscape of fear, uh, we have to understand that there are times and places where resources might not be available to us because the risk is too great. Uh, going back to the crocodile example, it's, it's a really pretty poignant example of uh, wildlife needing to get to water, especially during a drought. But if you know that there is a crocodile in that water, you might ask yourself, how badly do I need a drink? Um, am I willing to go down there and risk encountering a crocodile? And you have to weigh, again, the risks. You have to balance out your needs. And uh, this helps keep the ecosystem functioning because not only is it in place for herbivores, but it's also in place for carnivores as well. Um, a wolf might come to a kill made by a mountain lion, and the mountain lion perhaps worked very hard to bring that elk or that deer down, um, but it has to try and consume as much as possible, constantly looking over its shoulder, afraid of the wolves or the grizzly bears that might show up and bump the mountain lion off of its own kill. So it's this complicated game of hide and seek and understanding that uh, there is a monster in the woods or there's a monster in your closet, but you're just not sure which monster or which closet the monster is in. So it's constantly influencing which resources you're willing to, to risk to get and which ones you choose perhaps to avoid. We also have what's known as trophic cascades as a part of um, the ecology of fear. This has become popularized since wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone. And I have given a presentation on trophic cascades in Yellowstone and talked about how it's the popular narrative is, is really too simplistic. Um, and I encourage you to watch that. I think it was called Wolves and Willows and Elk or something like that. Um, but trophic cascades is basically how predators can indirectly uh, affect not only their prey, but also the prey of their prey. Um, so at multiple trophic levels, um, we can have uh, indirect and direct effects. And uh, one of the most popular studies that was done on this, and I think it was in the 80s, it might've been the 70s by a, a man named Robert Payne. Uh, he basically went out into the tidal zone on the Pacific Northwest coast, if I remember correctly. And he did his study on trophic cascades based off of his removal of sea stars in an area where they were um, consuming bivalves. And by removing the, the sea stars, he saw an increase in the bivalves and a decrease in, in the biodiversity of that area. Um, but pretty interesting stuff. Fear in 
the case of predation also can facilitate coexistence because one species might be better at competing in one habit while another might have a better competi competitive edge in another. Um, so you can have things that coexist like great white sharks and orcas and you can have um, an abundance of fish that tend to be nocturnal and others that tend to be diurnal. So this temporal and spatial trade-off that takes place um, allows for more biodiversity. Uh, in this case, again, a snake might be diurnal. It's cold-blooded, so it likes to be out in the sun and get warm, and it's gonna be chasing after that mouse. Um, there's direct competition for resources between that snake and the owl, but the owl can have uh, the temporal trade-off with the snake of being the predator at night. Um, again, allowing for, for more biodiversity on the landscape. And if there's more prey biodiversity, this also encourages uh, more or higher predator biodiversity. There's a lot of studies that talk about how um, in Yellowstone, the most important prey item for carnivores is the montane bull, which is like a little mouse. Every carnivore in Yellowstone basically eats these voles. And thankfully, we have more prey items available to the carnivores in Yellowstone because a grizzly bear population is going to have a hard time subsisting just off of the montane vole. A grizzly bear or a few grizzly bears could, but not a very robust population. Um, nevertheless, if a grizzly bear is down on its luck and can't get uh, enough trout and can't get enough white bark pine seeds and can't find a bison carcass that isn't already taken. Um, perhaps a, a grizzly bear can spend a few days or a few weeks even digging up um, rodent holes and consuming those montane voles, which also provide food for your pine martens, your coyotes, your fox, and a whole host of other predators on the landscape. And again, predator facilitation. I kind of already talked about this, going back to it already, um, that you can have an exploitation of fear responses. So your prey, if a, a crocodile, again, is not, it's not a very quick uh, on its feet. It's not very likely to make a meal of a zebra on land. Um, nevertheless, the zebra needs to get food or needs to get water. And so in avoiding the lion, it goes down to the water and can become a meal of, of the crocodile. But if it were to spend all of its time in the water, um, it, it would quickly become extinct and therefore it has to uh, exist where it evolved to exist, which is up on the land. So in conclusion, I will just say that predation is a very complex but very interesting way that organisms have evolved to forage. And again, foraging, the consumption of, of uh, nutrients, of calories, is the most important animal behavior that is out there. Uh, if you can't eat, then you won't make it. You won't have babies. You won't be able to survive. Uh, foraging is, is really what everything boils down to, is the intake of, of nutrients and calories in order for an organism to survive. And predation is one of the most common ways that we see this in the animal kingdom. And it not only takes place at a higher trophic level where we have large carnivores like lions killing and eating wildebeests, but it takes place at the very smallest of levels where um, parasites or even uh, uh, sanguivores like this mosquito are taking um, resources away from their host. Um, and it also takes place at, at a vegetable level where herbivores like this horse are eating grasses. So thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you, Erin. That was so interesting. Um, we are going to start our Q&A now. So I definitely invite our audience to submit any questions they have in your control panel under the questions field. Um, all right. Uh, first question that came in was, are polyphagous and omnivore the same thing, like a raven? Yeah, yep, they are. So it's just a fancy word that we sometimes use, but omnivore is equally acceptable. All right. 
Uh, next question, uh, the sea star study showed uh, what a keystone species is. Are any of these predators you've been speaking about today considered keystone species? Yes, yeah, some of them are. And I am, I admit, one biologist that is kind of leery of the word keystone species because a keystone species, if you're not familiar, uh, suggests that one species holds together a working ecosystem. Um, I think that it's there are keystone species out there, but I would argue that there's more of uh, there's more importance in a keystone guild. So, for example, I'm a large carnivore biologist. I work with wolves and bears. Um, it's not just wolves that make the ecosystem function. Uh, it's it's the complex suite of carnivores that help the ecosystem function. Um, and I kind of hit on this in my presentation on Yellowstone's trophic cascades, but um, simply restoring the wolf did not improve the ecosystem in Yellowstone. It was also the resurgence of mountain lions and grizzly bears that helped. So um, yes, Keystone species are often predators, and I think that uh, it usually takes it takes everyone in order to hold the ecosystem together. Yeah, yeah, complex issue. Uh, so next question: uh, For a predator that feeds on a single prey type, if their prey starts starts to gradually decrease. Will the predator evolve to consume something else? And if so, do we know how quickly this can happen? So yes, but it can take a very long time. But there are also a lot of studies that show that in some cases, um, evolution doesn't take as long as sometimes we are predisposed to thinking it will take. Um, so if you have dramatic evolutionary changes in the physiology of an organism, um, we're talking about millions of years, but for a lot of species, which are much more simplistic in their physical makeup, um, they can respond in decades even. So it just depends on how many generations pass, and it also can depend on what other similar food or foraging opportunities are available. So it's complicated. It's complicated. Uh, I mean, Perhaps the most basic example that comes to mind that I've used several times today is panda bears. They're, they specialize in eating bamboo. And if they were to lose bamboo forests tomorrow, then that obviously would not be enough time for them to change or to evolve. And there's nothing else that is similar to the bamboo that a, a panda bear population could switch to. Um, but over an extended period of time, there's a lot of other opportunities for animals to, to gradually make those changes. That's not a guarantee for all species. Species have been going extinct since the origin of life started. Um, and in some cases it is because uh, different species were, were too specialized and they lost a food source and then they, they went extinct. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this next question is about cats. They've been described as perfectly engineered killing machines. And if this is the case, why haven't they outcompeted all other predators? Well, I would agree that they are the best example today of a predator. Um, they are extremely efficient, way more efficient at killing than um, we, we call them the caniforums, so the, the dog group of the order carnivora, which includes bears as well as your foxes and your wolves and your coyotes and your also includes, includes your weasels, etc. Um, one reason why they haven't outcompeted everything else is because cats are obligate carnivores. So they are specialists, more or less. They can only digest meat. Um, everything else that is a large carnivore, such as a wolf and a bear, has more of a generalist diet, and they are capable of practicing uh, foraging behaviors that are more reflective of, of an omnivore's diet. Um, and that, 
I mean, that includes wolves, not just bears. So there's no sense in there. I guess it removes the question of competition because if a grizzly bear and a mountain lion both eat elk, the mountain lion might be better at it, but the grizzly bear is bigger and meaner and will chase away the mountain lion and can eat that kill. Or even if that didn't happen, the grizzly bear can consume uh, vegetable matter and, and do just fine. Um, so as a generalist um, competing with a specialist, there's room to share so they can both coexist on the landscape. And this goes with dogs and cats as well. There's, there's enough room and variability in a dog's diet for there not to be direct competition. Mm, okay. Uh, we're getting close to the top of the hour, so I'll take one more question and then we'll call it for the day. Um, someone wrote in about uh, the manatees and how there's been a strategy of feeding them. I, I believe it was something like lettuce in order to help them do declining kelp forests. Um, I don't know if you can speak to this directly, but maybe more generally, this person wanted to know if that was helping them. So is there maybe a strategy uh, with, you know, similar to manatees with with other species about, you know, if their uh, food source is declining, helping them out? Yeah, I'm not familiar with manatees, um, so I, I can't speak to that directly. But yeah, there are, um, <laughs> I mean, this is not the best example, but it's a classic example that comes to mind. Uh, at the end of the 1800s and the early 1900s, our deer and elk populations had been decimated and people, particularly in the Wyoming area, decided to help deer and elk populations recover by providing them with alfalfa hay. Um, alfalfa hay is, is not endemic or indigenous to this part of North America. Um, nevertheless, by providing supplemental feed, the deer and elk populations were able to recover and become robust again. Now, I'm not going to get into the the complexity and of you know where we're at now with chronic wasting disease and disease transmission because of continued supplemental feeding programs. But my point is that yeah, there there are opportunities out there for animals to switch their prey. We talked about prey switching and to take advantage of resources that are either um, artificially provided for them or in some cases even naturally um, provided as the individual gravitates towards whatever is most abundant on the landscape. All right, well, uh, again, I'll call it there with questions for today. And Aaron, thank you so much. This has been super interesting as always. Um, I'm gonna hand it back over to you for any closing comments. Yeah, thanks everyone. Oh, there we go. Thanks for uh, tuning in. Uh, appreciate it. I know today was a bit dense and jargony, but I do think that predation and these topics help us to better appreciate uh, the animal kingdom at large. And so when we have presentations specifically about uh, one species or another, we can kind of take these broader themes and apply it to to what we're interested in. So thanks again for tuning in. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Aaron. And my thanks as well to everyone who tuned in today. Be sure to join us next week for our next Daily Dose of Nature. And again, later today, you can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we'll have the replay available on our website soon. And with that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. Have a great weekend.